ERCP pictures, and we had the pictures of just the bile ducts, and they were trying to figure out where the liver was. And it's a little tough for me to figure out a way to show that, but I did my best. So this is a picture of the anatomy, and this is in gray, the ERCP scope going down the bowel, just opposite the ampulla vata, and then a catheter going up into the bile duct. And so when you see the scope down here in the catheter, the common bile duct is going up here, and then just in the hilum liver it branches. So you have the left ducts and the right ducts and the gallbladders in there someplace. Now I tried to take some of those ERCP pictures and try to superimpose a liver, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so here's the ERCP scope coming down. Here's the catheter going in. This is the common bile duct. Here's the bifurcation at the uh, left and the right, and then the bile ducts up in here. And here's the cystic duct with the gallbladder. This is the other normal one I showed you, the ERCP scope here. The rest of it's probably coming over here. The patient's been t twisted a little bit to show this better. So the catheter is down here. This is the common bile duct. Here's the bifurcation, the left ducts, the right ducts. Here, there is no gallbladder. And this is the one with the sclerosing cholangitis. Here's the scope. This is the catheter. Here's the common bile duct with all the dilations and strictures. And in this case, the liver lobe should be bigger here and bigger here. These are the intrahepatic ducts. So maybe that, I'll try to get these posted on C-Tools for you also, but I was trying to show you the relationship here of the liver to where these bile ducts are. Okay. Question? Yeah. So he's asking about, are we trying to avoid the pancreatic ducts? It depends on what your goal is. We were talking about cholestatic liver diseases, so we really want to look at the bile duct. As Michelle Anderson and Grace Elta will tell you later this week, the pancreas is a very touchy organ. And one of the risks of ERCP when we're messing around the ampulla or injecting dye in the pancreatic duct is can we create pancreatitis? So if at all possible, you want to avoid the pancreatic duct. It's just the two of them come together there and we can't avoid it completely. But especially for anything having to do with the biliary system, you're really trying to look only at that. But we do inject in the pancreatic duct and you'll see a number of pictures tomorrow about that. So both today and a lecture on Thursday are things that I put together as kind of a miscellaneous group of GI topics that kind of pick up some common problems that really don't get treated that well in our other general lectures that are doing more on physiology and the whole organ. And actually this talk originated with one of your colleagues a number of years ago who in the post uh, sequence comments said, I got all the way through a GI course and I still don't know what hemorrhoids are, but I can fix that. So we're going to talk about several different topics today. Um, and today we're going to talk about a little bit about hiatal hernia, which you've heard about, a little bit more about gas, constipation, some about diverticuli, which I believe you had something in your pathology section on also, and hemorrhoids. So a hiatal hernia means that the top of the stomach is above the diaphragm through the hiatus where normally just the esophagus goes. So it's an anatomic abnormality. So normally you have the lower esophageal sphincter right at about the hiatus of the diaphragm and there's various ligaments that try to hold that in place along with a little fat. And that really keeps everything in there and helps also keep the lower esophageal sphincter closed. When, there, when the diaphragm hiatus widens or there's a lot of pressure in the abdomen, some of this will, some of the stomach will go up into the chest cavity. That's a hiatal hernia. Very common. 
Some of my radiology colleagues say if they push hard enough on the stomach, they can probably create a little bit of a temporary hiatal hernia in just about anybody. Um, patients are very proud of the fact I have a hiatal hernia. And I'm telling, well, so do most other people, and it doesn't mean much. Don't worry about it. And you can see it endoscopically, because here we've got the pearly pink of the esophagus. And this is the lower esophageal sphincter. But then you're looking at the pinker rugal folds of the stomach. And there's another indentation there. That's the edge of the diaphragm. You can go down into the stomach and turn around and look back. Here's the diaphragm edge. Here's the lower esophageal sphincter. So from there to there is the hiatal hernia. And the radiologists can see it. They can tell where the diaphragm is. They can see the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. And here's this. So radiologists on various barium studies will comment that the patient has a hiatal hernia. <coughs> it's usually benign. It does make you more predisposed to acid reflux and its complications because the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't work as adequately when it's up in the mid-chest um, because its relationship and the twist and the bend and its relationship to some of the ligaments is different so that you can get more acid reflux. And because the hiatal hernia, so you get more reflux, because this is, is trapped a little bit, Acid can sit in that stomach pouch, and you can sometimes get gastric ulcers up there. They're called Cameron's lesions, and we will occasionally see those in patients. But that's about all that a hiatal hernia does. So you are more educating and reassuring your patients. I wanted to make a few more uh, comments about gas, because these are things that patients will ask all of you about. Your relatives may ask all of you about it. So you need to be prepared with a little information. So gas is another common, it's a physiologic function of the bowel, but it can make people upset or worried. And it's been the source of many elements of humor. It's a normal constituent. It helps cause bowel sounds. Anything that goes in has to come out. So any air that you air swallow has to come out. Everybody passes flatus actually many times a day, but most of us aren't aware of most of it. Some people become very aware, and they're complaining about what's probably normal gas. If you infuse gas into the GI tract, it actually goes through much faster than liquid and solid. Nobody's figured that out yet exactly how, but it does. So how do you get gas in the intestine? Of course, when you air swallow, three quarters of that is nitrogen, 21% oxygen. And you will generate some CO2 as gastric acid is neutralized in the duodenum. Well, a lot of that CO2 and a bunch of the oxygen is actually soluble across the small bowel membrane and gets absorbed and goes out in the lungs. So the, but the nitrogen is not. So the nitrogen is going to make it all the way down into the colon. Plus, we've already talked about that bacterial fermentation can generate a number of gases in the colon. So from carbohydrate, you can get methane, carbon dioxide, hydrogen gas, proteins, and, and um, sulfur-containing compounds from things like onions uh, can create hydrogen sulfide, which is the smelly component, and other sulfur-based volatile compounds. Yes, the colon can absorb some of these, but not all of them. And so this is the mixture that comes out. If you have lots of carbohydrate malabsorption, you're probably going to pass out lots of gas. Cows do this all the time. That's what's going on in their rumen. So when you look at grazers, horses, ponies, cattle, they are eating grass. We don't, mammals don't have all the enzymes to break down all of those complex carbohydrates that form cell walls in grasses. So you have to rely on bacterial fermentation. The cattle do it in their rumen. The ponies do it in their cecum. So they produce a fair amount of methane. And there have suggestions been made about a way to improve our natural gas supply 
is to bag the cows and gather the methane. But nobody's figured out how to do this efficiently yet. But it's coming. It's recyclable. You plant the grass, you feed the cow, you gather the methane and the milk. Yeah, okay. Um, this is just an example of showing that how, when you infuse gas over 90, 180 minutes, how much is it, is, is it evacuated and how fast. And you can see as, at a slow rate, it comes out slowly. The faster you put it in, the faster it comes out. So gas, for some reason, seems to travel through the gut pretty rapidly. Okay, now most times at any one time in your gut, there's a relatively small amount of gas. I mean, here you're seeing little bits in some of the colon. There'd be an air bubble in the stomach, which is all swallowed air, and a little bit, little blibs in parts of the small bowel, and there's some down here in the rectum, but that's fairly small. We've shown you pictures of patients who have an obstruction. They will continue to swallow air. And so, and there may in the colon at least be some gas generated. So here you're seeing huge loops of small bowel. They're small bowel because you can see the valvuli conventes all the way across, and they're in the middle of the bowel. And then you've got colon with the big haustral folds. This person clearly has excess gas. And to get gas like this, you have to either have a distal obstruction or the bowel stop moving. An ileus, bad dysmotility. And in the surgery service, you'll see some patients after an operation who have prolonged ileus, and it's really difficult to manage. This is primarily in the colon, right colon, transverse colon. You see little haustral folds here and here, but there's nothing that goes all the way across. And then there's the descending colon, clearly too much gas. There's a little bit in small bowel here, but not distended to the same extent. So most people, it turns out, who complain of gas symptoms actually have relatively normal amounts of gas. Instead, they have a sensation of increased gut distension or increased flatus. You can, however, get true increases in gas if you have excessive air swallowing or excessive bacterial fermentation of carbohydrate. So gas symptoms that people come to you complaining about are bloating, belching, and enlarged abdomen, passing excess flatus, things like that. Now bloating is one of the less loved symptoms of gastroenterologists. It's very common, and we often can't make people really happy about their symptom because there are many different causes. Clearly, you want to look for altered motility and obstruction but you can have it produced from the intake of a number of foods that generate carbohydrate uh, fermentation. You can have an altered gut flora, such as bacterial overgrowth in the small bowel, where you'll get gas production. You get abnormal sensations of the amount of fullness that's in the bowel and visceral reflexes. People who are constipated may have so much stool in their colon, they feel full and bloated even though it's not gas, it's actually stool. And then there's this sensation that's been described where people simply relax the anterior abdominal muscles and their, their, uh, their diaphragm comes down and they bloat out, but they actually don't have anything in there. So this is actually what's often seen on the x-ray of patients who come in to see us in GI clinic and complain of gas and bloating an absolutely normal x-ray, and I often will do this and show it to the patients and say, yes, you've got a problem, but it's not too much volume of gas. So most of it is this abnormal sensation. It may be due to poor compliance of the stomach or gut. It's often in obese patients, and I remind them there's a lot of other stuff in there. It can trigger the sense of erectation and belching. And what happens when you feel full and bloated is the anterior abdominal muscles will relax. Patients come in and say, I'm okay in the morning. I have a breakfast. By lunchtime, I'm feeling kind of full. By the end of the day, I look like I'm eight months pregnant, and I'm fine the next morning. That is not ascites. That is not constipation. That is not fat. That is relaxation of the anterior abdominal wall going out and then coming back. 
And here's a study that was done with three-dimensional CT scanning and tagging air and then subtracting everything. And this is a uh, patient, um, and these are real patients, um, who complained of tremendous bloating. And you can see that the distance here between the iliac crest and the diaphragm um, during the, in the morning was quite high, and the distance between the vertebra and the anterior abdominal wall was fairly small. The green are all the pockets of gas, which could be identified. Later in the day, when they said they were totally full and bloated, there was a little extra gas here when you added all of this up, but primarily the diaphragm had come down and the anterior abdominal muscle wall had gone out. And that was accounting for why they were wearing loose trousers or loose putting their, you know, their, their waistband down around their lower hip, things like that. Now, a patient who has dysmotility of the bowel, this is a patient with uh, pseudo-obstruction, very, very poor motility throughout the entire bowel, probably also has bacterial overgrowth and is generating bacteria, is generating gas. This was in the morning before they had a high-carbohydrate meal. And this was later in the day. There's a tremendous increase in the actual amount of gas that's there. But these patients are actually quite rare. Now, belching is another thing that people do when they feel like there's too much air. And it's a reflex response of letting air going back up the esophagus. It's not rumination. It's not vomiting. It's completely separate. And it may release some gastric air, and people feel better. Now, you have to do it when you're upright, because in your stomach, you've got liquid. You've got an air fluid level. When you're upright, the gas is on top. When you're lying on your back, the esophagus is actually more posterior, and the gas is usually anterior. So people can't actually belch very well when they're lying flat. But if they turn over and they're prone or they sit up, they can. Now, the problem is that sometimes when some people belch, they actually swallow more air when they're beginning the belch than they get rid of. And that's been tested with um, what are called xenon washout studies, where you can use radioactive xenon to actually calculate the volume. And so at, prior to the belch, they actually subconsciously swallow additional air. Then the LES relaxes, and air is released up, but the net loss may not be all that much or may actually be negative. So continued belching can actually generate more net air in the stomach. So you can try to, try to convince patients not to belch as much because it may make it worse. Use a straw or some device so when they're taking in fluids, they're not sipping and sucking in as much air. Have the liquids with your meals. Don't be sipping beverages all day long. Um, and things like chewing gum and sucking on candies, you're continuously swallowing, and each of that is air swallowing. Gas from carbonated drinks probably plays a very minor role in most patients. Other gas symptoms are due to reflex relaxation, you need to reassure the patient. Now, lower gas, flatus, that's normal, but clearly if you're generating air swallowing or if you're generating flatus in the colon, that's going to cause a problem. And it can be due to changes in intake or changes in gut bacteria. If they complain of really noxious flatus, ask them about their diet, because that usually requires they're taking in a lot of high sulfur-containing products. Meat, because all protein contains sulfur groups, and all of the onions and cabbage family members have a lot of sulfur-containing compounds in them. So cabbage, Brussels sprouts, lots of onions. Some people just get a ton of noxious gas from that, and if they stop those, it'll go away. We have to educate people on what kinds of foods can cause flatus, milk being a common one, but then there are these other items. We already talked about lactose. Here are other things to ask about if people are taking a lot of these they can get extra flatus. So that's my history when somebody comes in. Because I'm asking what they're putting in their mouths, see if there's anything I can suggest. They do a dietary exclusion and see if it solves the problem. 
Treatment of gas. There's really poor evidence for any of this. Reassurance, reduce air swallowing, suppress belching, try promotility agents like metoclopramide. For some people who really complain of a lot of upper, that may help. There are side effects to metoclopramide, so it's not necessarily what we want to give everybody. Cymethicone is the anti-gas agent. When you see gas X or antacids with, uh, that are anti-gas, it's cymethicone. What it does is reduce surface tension on bubbles, so it makes smaller bubbles, and they might pass through easier. We actually use cymethicone when we're doing endoscopy, particularly when we're down in the duodenum. You have bile acids coming in there. They're detergents. Sometimes we just have difficulty seeing because all these bubbles, we're putting air in, and they've got detergent there, and we are generating air bubbles. It's like that old blowing in the air bubble. We throw some cymethicone down through the scope, and the bubbles all disappear. It's wonderful. Um, try to identify foods. This is where, if all else fails, try some probiotics. We have no idea which ones work better for whom. There is some evidence that Pepto-Bismol and zinc can both block the production of some of the hydrogen sulfide. You have to take them about four times a day. Um, that's for the really end-stage patients. And then consider, do they have a malabsorptive disorder that you need to find out and treat? So constipation is another difficult problem that everyone has to deal with, no matter what your specialty. I can't tell you how many people come in to see me about their chronic liver disease and say, oh, by the way, can you deal with my constipation? Can you deal with my bloating? I'm saying, oh, God, please. <laughs> yes, we can deal with this. So constipation is less than three stools a week, usually difficult to pass. There's often straining or a sense of incomplete evacuation. The prevalence of self-perceived constipation is at least 10 to 20% in the average American population. But sometimes that means you have to define constipation for your patient. If they're passing soft stool, it's easy to pass, and they're having three stools a week, that's fine. That can be, that's perfectly normal. And occasional constipation, depending on how your diet changes, is a part of normal life for most humans. The Arctic explorers who were living on meat had a big problem with constipation. Um, so the pathophysiology we've talked about is liquid material enters the cecum from the ileum. The colon reabsorbs electrolytes in water. It salvages some carbohydrate. It moves material in a timely fashion to the rectum. But if you have imbalances in these function, you can either have too much liquid stool coming around or too much hard stool coming around. So you can have slow colon transit. And this is where your history of the medications the patient's on are key. Some of the most common causes are we put people on narcotics, calcium channel blockers, anticholinergics, cholestyramine, and then they're somehow surprised they come in complaining of constipation. If you're going to start one of these drugs, talk to the patient about the side effect. You might not need to give them anything right now, but make them aware of that so that you can help them when it develops. Motility decreases, primarily diabetes or hypothyroidism, and idiopathic. Increased bowel sodium and water absorption is probably the cause of constipation in some of our patients. We just don't understand the mechanisms or why that happens. Insufficient fiber. Well, fiber is an unabsorbed complex carbohydrate. It increases stool bulk, and a clinical observation is that bulkier stools, patients tend to move that stuff through in better time, and they tend to be less constipated. We don't quite understand that, but the human colon clearly evolved with hunter-gatherers who had a very high fiber diet. They were out there eating a lot of plant stuff that had tons of fiber in it because we can't digest it. In addition, some fibers are fermented to osmotically active compounds, which adds water to the stool. As I said, it may improve colonic motility. Insufficient bile acids. We've talked about if you get rid of all the bile acids in the colon, you may get constipation. It's usually not a problem unless you give people cholestyramine. Then that's an expected complication. There also are patients who can't pass stool well because they have problems in the anal rectal area with the musculature at the anal sphincter or pelvic floor dysfunction. 
that's a highly specialized area. Um, and so if patients say, I have to sit in the toilet for an hour, it's really difficult to push things out, then you probably need to refer them to somebody who can do the testing for these maneuvers. Psychological factors and eating disorders are part of this, but we don't completely understand that one either. But most of those folks are on a low-fiber diet, which probably isn't helping. So I talked about the enterohepatic circulation of bile acids with a little bit getting into the colon, which probably keeps our stools somewhat loose. Cholestyramine binds that up. And a predictable side effect in virtually everyone who takes it is harder, less frequent stools. So treatment. Look for any underlying factors, of course. Add fiber. So for an average person with average constipation in the United States, where we generally have fairly low fiber diets, advice is always start with fiber. And you can advocate high fiber foods, but many people just can't eat enough of them. Or their lifetime diet is so different, they can't, you can't change your lifetime diets very well. So then adding purified fiber, which is sold over the counter, you start with a small dose and you just keep working up slowly until the stools are big and bulky. The only problem, of course, is some of those patients will develop flatus. They will not like you. Then we have osmotic agents. This should work in everybody. Just depends on how much you have to give. So you can use milk of magnesia in small doses. You can give sorbitol or lactulose, which are sugary syrups that you can measure out by the tablespoon. The one we really have all started to use a lot is the thing called Miralax polyethylene glycol. It's a non-absorbable, small molecular weight, osmotically active material. It was developed originally for our colon prep procedures, but now they purify it and sell it on its own. And you are basically adding an osmotic agent to the colon. Again, you start with the one capful a day that it says is the dose, and you just keep increasing slowly until patients are having soft stools. This you cannot get gas from. These you can get gas from. Promotility agent, sometimes we use that in addition in people, say, who have very bad diabetes and have motility problems as well. Uh, but it has limited efficacy in the colon. It's better in the stomach. Then you have stimulant laxatives. These have both motor and secretory effects. There are some people who failed all of these other things. You have to use them on a regular basis. We used to think they did something to the colon motility. Now we think by destroying it. Now we think the problem is these folks have an underlying dysmotility that we can't identify, and that's progressing over time. They just need to use these. Patients say they want to be depend they don't want to be dependent. Tell me, you're dependent already. Your colon isn't working. These will help your colon work. Okay. And then monitor what's going on. Now, part of our job as physicians is also to get rid of myths that our patients may have. And there are a lot of myths out there. One myth is that having one stool a day is required for normal health. It's not. There's a wide range of normal. That really helps with a lot of your patients. They discover they're not as abnormal as they thought they were. You don't need to do anything else. A control trial was done on exercise. Doesn't work. Not on regular people, regular constipation, regular types of exercise. Now, patients who do marathons, who do lots of running, they get all kinds, they can get all kinds of bowel problems. They can get ischemia in the bowel. They can have bleeding. They may well have very altered motility. And there are individuals who say for them exercise makes a big difference. But in general, for most people where it's been studied, this is not going to be a cure. But exercise is always good, so I wouldn't discourage it. Drinking more water. What happens to the water that you are all drinking right now? Gets into your small bowel. What happens to it? It's absorbed. Where does it go? Out the kidneys. You can't get water into the colon just by drinking water. You have to have an osmotic agent to hold it there. So just telling people to drink eight glasses of water a day, in most cases, is not going to solve their constipation. Eight glasses of water and some Miralax a day 
will probably work quite well. Colase, it's on every hospital's formulary. It's part of the standard orders that you'll be taught to write for every patient because people come in the hospital and they get constipated. And the only controlled studies ever done showed no effect on increasing frequency or size of stool. So I would love to have that removed from every hospital's order set and put in Miralax instead, based on science. But it's still there, so you can order it. There are some individuals who have been on it a long time, and they will tell you, if I stop it, I'll get constipated again. So again, there probably are a few individuals for whom it works. But in general, it has really limited efficacy. Now I wanted to talk a bit here, and when we're talking about the colon, about a complication called diverticuli. Also extremely common. Most middle-aged and older Americans have at least a few of these. So when people say, oh, my doctor did this colonoscopy, told me I had diverticuli. OK, join the average American population. Um, so diverticuli are outpouchings. They do not contain all the elements of the bowel wall. And they occur at places where the perforating arteries go through the muscle. So the blood vessels come in on the mesentery, track around in the, sub, in the serosa or just below the serosa, and then penetrate into the inner layers. This is why the mucosa is more vulnerable to ischemia or hypotension. It's the last thing on the line getting oxygen. But it also means that at the places where the artery penetrates through the muscle, you have a weakness. And as pressures in the colon mount over time, you can get mucosa and the serosa bulging out as a diverticulum. Very, very common. And often they'll have a little draping artery right over them. So it can start like this and then works its way all the way through. And when you're doing colonoscopy, that's the lumen there, you'll see these side openings, which are diverticuli. Extraordinarily common. We see them all the time. Sometimes they get really, really big. When you get this many big ones, there may be a disease of the elastic tissue or something else going on there. So this is part of the colon. Um, there's the fat on the outside and the lumen, and these are all these huge, wide mouth diverticuli. This is that patient who, before surgery, had barium swallow. Barium went through the bowel, then they waited a couple of days till the barium had gone out of the colon and took an x ray. And this is barium stuck in all of these diverticuli because it can't get out. And now you see the barium lighting up all the diverticuli. This is just showing you how big they can get. But this is, this is somebody with scleroderma. At surgery, here's the sigmoid colon up here. You've got fat around that. And in this case, you have all these little blue diverticuli going off. These are all normal. Just happens to be you're seeing it. Now, what complications can occur? Well, considering the number of diverticuli per person multiplied by the middle-aged and older population of the United States, there could be 100 million, 200 million diverticuli out there. Now, that means that when a problem occurs, even if it's rare, we see a lot of it. So we see a lot of people with complications of diverticuli. Given the number of diverticuli out there, the probability of getting a problem from your diverticuli or any one of them is fairly low. So you can do two things. First of all, stool can get in there, and it does. If it ulcerates the, the mucosa and erodes into that underlying artery, you get a diverticular bleed. This is not a subtle bleed. This is not hemocult positive stool. This is bright red blood and, pl and clots pouring out of the rectum, usually, because it's under arterial pressure. <laughs> Just like a duodenal ulcer bleed can be a really big bleed. It's an artery, OK? Diverticular bleed. I'll show you some pictures. Second thing is if you obstruct that narrow neck, 
you've got colonic material inside, which is loaded with what? Bacteria. So normally you've got bacteria in the lumen of the bowel. It's some of it's getting washed out every day in the stool. Stools are 50% bacteria. Um, but the, the diverticulum is a blind end. So you have bacteria in there growing away. And if they, again, ulcerate through, they can perforate through that thin wall of the diverticulum and cause a little abscess outside. That's diverticulitis. So you have diverticuli. If one gets infected and perforates, that's diverticulitis. And you often have to explain the difference to patients. OK, so diverticulitis, here you've got a large bowel with some diverticuli. There, one of them underneath this perforated. And bacteria and fecal material then leaks out into the peritoneum. Now, the nice thing is this is often happening down in the sigmoid colon. There's a huge omentum there. And usually, the omentum covers it all up. So you get a contained abscess. Now, Mike Mulholland, I think, had a case he was talking to you about in his lecture about somebody who got free air. Because, of course, if this perforates out into the open peritoneum, you get spillage of gas, stool, and everything else out into the peritoneum. But most cases, the omentum plasters over this, and you get a contained abscess, which is why the patients come in with some pain and a fever, but they're not critically ill. They don't have peritonitis. They don't need to go to the OR right away. And we can usually clean that up with antibiotics. Now, of course, it can get big. And if it gets big and you don't take care of it, it can erode into other things close by, like the bladder, the vagina, things like that. Um, it can rupture. And that's where you get free air and you get peritonitis, because you get fecal material and bacteria spreading throughout the entire abdomen. So that can happen, but that's much less common. Probably 95 plus percent are going to be a contained abscess. This is a CT scan. Um, here is the iliac crest. The spine is down here. This is the anterior abdominal wall with the muscle. This is a sigmoid colon. You've got a thickened wall from the inflammation. You've got some air pockets and diverticuli. Um, and it happens that there's a inflammation here, which is causing thickening of that wall of the colon. So the colon wall should be very thin, but here you're seeing the mucosa. This is the outside that's very thickened. And sometimes that thickening, there's so much edema there that you actually get an obstruction. It's because the wall of the bowel next to this abscess has so much edema. It gets thickened. So some people will come in with constipation. They haven't passed any bowel movements because there's so much edema here, things can't get through. But they also have pain. They may, this is an infection. They have a fever and a white count. If it perforates, it can travel other places. So you can actually get fistulas into small bowel, skin, bladder, whatever. So these are complications of diverticuli that can occur, but they're fairly uncommon. But if you see a fistula to another part of the bowel, if you see a fistula coming to the outside world, if you see a fistula going into the bladder, a diverticular abscess is one of the things that can do that. What's the other one? Crohn's. Yeah, those would be the two top players. TB can do it, but TB in the bowel is very rare in this country. They can then bleed. They don't do the same thing together. It's a rule. I don't know who made it up or why, but it's a rule. We don't see bleeding diverticuli and diverticulitis in the same patient at the same time. You get one or the other. I can't promise you won't get the other at some time in the future, but you get one or the other. So again, you have a draping arterial around the outside 
And if an ulcer erodes into it, you get arterial blood being pumped into the lumen. And this is usually in the sigma. I mean, you can have diverticuli anywhere in the colon. They can be on the right side. But the most common location is the sigmoid. Pumping blood into the sigmoid, you're going to put that out as bright red blood pretty rapidly. Here's looking in at a diverticulum. In this case, there's just a little bit of blood there. And we can actually sometimes treat that. Here it's um, been treated. But the radiologist can also do it by an angiogram and finding the bleeding area. So there are a couple of ways we can try to get it to stop. The thing that saves us on these is most people stop on their own eventually. You just have to keep them resuscitated and transfused and alive until they stop bleeding. But we do have some things we can do, especially in people who have recurrent bleeding. So again, myth busting. Clinical teaching says that people with diverticulitis should avoid nuts, seeds, popcorn, et cetera, to reduce the chance these might obstruct the mouth and cause diverticulitis. Get rid of that recommendation. There was never any data to support that. It was a hypothetical thing that got put in the literature decades ago. There's no evidence. And there actually was a study to try to look at this. This is part of the physician's um, health professional follow-up study, which was started probably in the 1960s, following 47,000 men. They were mostly men, because most physicians at that time were men. And there was an inverse relationship between intake of these foods and development of diverticulitis or other complications. Please don't torture your patients by telling them they can't have their raspberry jam, they can't eat peanuts, they can't eat popcorn for this reason. You may have other reasons you don't want to eat them, but not for this. OK. So I'm going to finish up with hemorrhoids, which is way at the other end. This is a very old illustrated manuscript showing that people had trouble with hemorrhoids way back then. This is somebody looking at external hemorrhoids. So they could look in the eye, they could look in the nose, they could look at the hemorrhoids. So you have to understand the anal anatomy for this. So if you look at the distal rectum, there's the dentate line, which I've outlined in orange, where you go from squamous epithelium to columnar epithelium. And you have the internal and external anal sphincters going around. There are cushions of vascularized tissue above the dentate line and just here externally. And it's thought that those help form a tight seal when the sphincter closes to help seal it so you don't leak any liquid or gas unnecessarily. Otherwise, we can't figure out why that tissue is there, because the only other problem is it causes trouble. So when these blood vessels dilate and the tissue expands, that's an internal hemorrhoid or an external hemorrhoid. If you have something on the skin, it can hurt. You've got sensation just like on the rest of your skin. Internal hemorrhoids are above the dentate line. You can biopsy. You can push at things here. It doesn't hurt. The surgeons deal with anything below the dentate line. We often deal with things above because you really need good sedation to do anything below the dentate line. It hurts. So these are vascular cushions of soft tissue with large vascular channels. Injury, age, passing of hard stool, fragments or damages these cushions or their supporting structures, so they sag. They sag forward and in toward the middle. Straining, when you bear down hard, increases venous pressure. And that will also cause engorgement of those vessels. Once the tissues start to swell and prolapse, then the passage of stool keeps pushing it down more and more. With trauma to the surface, you can get epithelial damage, leading to ulceration, bleeding, and sometimes pain. With external hemorrhoids, the worst pain comes from when some of those veins thrombose. And then people will come in with severe pain of a hemorrhoid, and it's because it's thrombosed. And the surgeons can actually open that up, pull out the clot, decompress that um, under good anesthesia. So internal hemorrhoids come from above the dentate line. 
external hemorrhoids below. Here's a side. So this is where the tissue has been prolapsing and pulled forward. Here's an external hemorrhoid right here. These are pictures of extremely large external or prolapsed internal hemorrhoids when you just look. Clearly, those are bad hemorrhoids. Now, from the inside, if you've got an endoscope and you're looking back at the anus, here you, the uh, anal sphincters down here, here are hemorrhoids and they're prolapsing down through the anal canal and out. Actually, this is an exterior view. Right, there's somebody's hand. On the internal side, you can see these big purplish hemorrhoids. These are relatively modest ones. They may not be causing the patient any problem. But if the surface gets a little excoriated, it can ooze. You can see little bits of bright red blood. You can see streaks of blood on the stool or the toilet paper. If you have a really huge hemorrhoid and the whole surface ruptures, you can have a big bleed, but that's actually pretty uncommon. So you get pain or irritation from prolapsed internal hemorrhoids or ulcerated thrombosis external hemorrhoids. You get small amounts of bright red blood. You can get a major bleed, but that's pretty uncommon. And when you have the prolapsing hemorrhoids, they're going all the way through the anal sphincter. You can't get a tight seal. So these patients may have uh, problems with liquid or stool incontinence to make their lives even more miserable. What's the management? There's very little evidence-based therapy. Again, most of these things are grandfathered in generations ago. Clearly, you'd like to reduce straining. If this is somebody who's been constipated and strains, that may help. So you want to soften the stool. We've talked about that. For pain or irritation, there's all kinds of things you can buy out there. Very little good evidence base to say whether they help or not. Primarily, they're giving the patient something to do, and a lot of this gets better on their own. But they can help. If you have a really painful external, you can get one of these donut ring seats so the hemorrhoids are sitting over the hole. Uh, that can help. Uh, you can get rid of them. You can sclerose these. You can put rubber bands around them, just like we do around varices. And surgery can cut them out. And this, this is really done by surgeons. So if you have painful or prolapsing or otherwise difficult hemorrhoids, you send, once you make the diagnosis, you send the patient to a surgeon. Here's just an example of rubber band ligation. There's a rubber band. And just like with a varix, that will necrose this tissue. And at some point, the band will fall off. And you hope that the vet blood vessel behind that thrombos. Occasionally, it doesn't. So if you see somebody coming into the emergency room is pouring out blood from the rectum, one of the pieces of history you want to know is, did you have something done to your hemorrhoids in the last few days? Is this, was this where the rubber band came off and the necrosed tissue came off and the blood vessel behind was not yet thrombosed? Okay, now we'll finish up with iron deficiency anemia on Thursday. See you tomorrow.